Last week, I talked with a preschool teacher, and this week I'm connecting with Meg Franco, a kindergarten teacher. I remember sending both of my girls off to kindergarten like it was yesterday. Ainsley started kindergarten during COVID, so that was a particularly unusual time and definitely stressful. But before that, I remember sending little Addison off on the school bus for her first day of kindergarten and feeling like I was sending my baby off into the big, big world. I was so hoping that she was well prepared. So I wanted to continue our conversation about what our teachers wish we knew by talking to a kindergarten teacher. Meg Franco is in her 25th year of teaching at Ivy Elementary School here in Charlottesville, and for 22 of those years, she has taught kindergarten. I promise that you're going to walk away from this episode with several aha moments, but I want to warn you that this is a long episode, so you may need to listen to it in a few sittings, but I want to encourage you to listen to the entire thing because all the way till the end, Meg shares so many great thoughts, ideas, and recommendations. So if you have a child in kindergarten or a soon-to-be kindergartner, this episode is for you. But before we dive in, I just want to note that Meg is sharing her personal thoughts based on her professional experience, and she is not speaking for the school where she works. Hi, I'm Allison Edgety, a pediatric sleep and wellness coach and a mom of two. I love to help parents find solutions. This is How Long Till Bedtime. All right. Hi, Meg. Thank you so much for joining me today. Beth, our mutual friend and also the producer of this podcast, connected us, and I'm so glad that she did. I'm really excited to talk to you about the things that you wish every parent sending their child to kindergarten knew because you have been a teacher for a very long time. And when we connected (laughs) earlier, you knew right away things Mm -hmm. you wanted to cover. So, The very first thing I like to ask my guest is what inspired you to pursue your vocation as a kindergarten teacher? Wow, I've always wanted to be a teacher, like since I was a kid. I literally made my high school brother and his friends sit in the basement in chairs while I taught them. Um, I think it was probably the influence of my elementary school teachers. And I worked as a nanny for six years. So the little ones have always been, had my heart. So that's really just, it's, it's an adventure every day and you don't know what's going to happen. I love that. I'm curious, is there one teacher you had in elementary school that really stands out in your mind as being transformational? My second grade teacher, Carol Patizanin. She lives in Wilmington, North Carolina, and I actually met her for dinner. Uh, a couple years ago, we went and had dinner, and I just thanked her for being amazing. She just, she made school fun. I love that. So as you're saying that, it's reminding me that my daughter, I can already tell you that the most transformational teacher she's had was her kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Martin, Mm -hmm. and she's an extreme introvert, my daughter, And I suspect Mrs. Martin is an extreme introvert Mm -hmm. because when I'm around her, she's very soft-spoken. She's now moved away. But she changed how my daughter felt about school, and she would jump in the car so excited to tell me about her day. And she went from early on Mrs. Martin actually calling me to say she doesn't play with other kids. Mm -hmm. She does parallel play on the playground, but by herself. And do you know she doesn't talk? It was kind of how it started. And I said, well, actually, she does talk, but she's very introverted. So we had this whole conversation, and she said, I get it. I see her. Mm -hmm. I know her. And by the end of that year, she had blossomed and was a leader in the classroom. 
And I don't know if they were kindred spirits that she understood her, but it changed everything. And she's in third grade now. And she still just talks about that wow. kindergarten teacher. Well, <laughs> so and you know, so I much. think as a kindergarten teacher, I feel that's probably one of the most important parts of my job is to make school fun and to make kids want to love coming to school and love school. Because if they don't like it from the get go, it's not going to get much better. <laughs> it's a power. It's a really powerful year, mm-hmm. I think, the kindergarten year for maybe not all the reasons that parents yes. think it is, which I think is a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. So let's dive okay. in. What is the first thing that you wish every parent knew before they sent their child to kindergarten? Well, there's lots of things. However, um, my my biggest thing is let your child be independent. I think uh, right now, a lot of families, time is such an issue, and it's quicker and easier to just do it for your child. And it really helps your child more if they are able to figure it out themselves. Give them a job at home. They can sort the socks and match them for you. They fold, teach them how to fold towels. They love to wash dishes. Um, making their bed, helping set the table, even picking their own clothes. We don't care if they come to school unmatched. It really doesn't matter. Actually, I love it because it really speaks to their personalities when they come in. Um, If their hair's wild, my first thing is, man, you must have had good dreams last night because I can really tell. And they're like, yeah, I did. Um, But they can do more than you give them credit for. And when we come to kindergarten, when they come to kindergarten, we can see that they depend on adults to do a lot for them. And I've got 25-year-old, five and six-year-olds in my room, and I would spend my entire day doing everything for them if I didn't. And I start from day one. They can't open something at snack. There's this wonderful, wonderful invention called scissors cut it open yourself. Um, Those are the kinds of things. Let them do it. My kids say my mom forgot to put my books and my library books in my my backpack. My dad forgot to put my folder. And my response to that is, hmm, wonder whose library books or folder those are. Well, they're mine. Hmm. Wonder who should be the one that should make sure they're in the backpack. And the kids are like, yeah, they can do it. It just, it, the hard part for parents is it takes more time and you want to be done and move on to the next thing. You know, we got to go, we got to get in the car. we got to get to the bus. That to me is the time it's time well spent. Absolutely. And I definitely fall into that camp. I have, and, and still do too much for my kids, um, I really focused on it actually this past summer. My kids are long out of kindergarten Mm -hmm. of teaching them to fold laundry and doing some things. But I was rushed a lot to get out the door. The other thing is one of my children would be willing to do things if I said, why don't you try that on your own or you can do that. The other child, it is her natural inclination to say, I can't do that. I need help. So I would love to know for the parent that says, well, easy for you to say, my child really pushes back on that. What is your advice if you have a child who says, but I can't do that, but I need your help? How would you have a parent respond to that? Well, I will say my husband and I, when when I have two stepdaughters who are grown up and on the West Coast now, but... The word can't was not used in our household. It's not that you can't do it. It's that it's too hard. I don't know how to do it. So I would say to the child, can't's a word that I just, I won't accept. You need to be more specific. What is it about it that you say you can't do? Is it hard? Do you not know how to do it? Do you not understand how to do it? Are you... What, what is it that makes it a challenge for you? And see if you can get to what that is, because then it might be, well, I don't know what to do. It might be, I don't want to do it, which nine times out of 10 is, is what the kids are like, but I just don't want to do it. 
I don't want to clean toilets, but you know, I have to do it. And so sometimes there's things you don't want to do that you just have to do. I am confident you can do it. I, and you know how I know? I've seen you do it before, so I know you know how to do it. Um, that, But get to the yeah. root of why they're saying they can't do it. What is it that, make, that has them saying they can't do it? There's something. You just have to get to what right. it is. Right. It's kind of like I heard of a lot of people who will say, maybe you don't know how to do it yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like adding adding that word. And then as you were talking and the advice you gave, it made me think of advice I had gotten from a therapist who said, some kids are going to need you to bridge them to get there. Mm -hmm. So the example I had given was my daughter resisting folding laundry. And it was, well, maybe initially you fold it together. You're both folding laundry mm -hmm. and you're going to have to bridge her to realizing she could actually fold that laundry without you sitting mm -hmm. there. And my struggle is that takes more time. Mm -hmm. it, it has worked. Yep. She now does fold laundry on her own, <laughs> but it did take time. It was a, a, a shift in my mindset because mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, the whole point of me wanting her to fold laundry is so I don't have to yes. take the time to fold all that laundry. So it, it's a little bit of a mind shift, mm -hmm. I think, for some of these kids. And the other thing you can do is tell, tell the kid, I need your help. I need you to help me help me do this. If we fold, if you're bridging, we fold the laundry together, then we'll have more time to play, read a book together, or then we'll have time to do something. Um, the other thing I would also say is everybody in our family has a job and we all do jobs mm -hmm. in our house. We all do things to help everybody else in our house. And so I need your help to do this job. Let me show you how to do it and then let's do it together. And then you do one and I'll do one. And then you can slowly, as you said before, kind of to wean away from it. Um, and then sometimes I just flat out say, oh, man, I forget how to fold a shirt. Ugh. And then we like, I know how to do that. It's easy. And, and they'll do it. So there, mm -hmm. there's ways to do it. But again, it goes back to, as you said, the time to take to do it but it's time well spent in the long run. You have to look for the look mm -hmm. for the, the goal at the end. So you mentioned opening snacks. Mm -hmm. What are other things, just true things that carry right over into kindergarten, things that they could have their child doing at home that you would see a direct benefit to them in kindergarten? So one obviously could be opening their own snack. Are there other things where you think, oh, yes, if they worked on that at home, it would save so much time for everyone? Packing their snack. They can pack their own snack because you don't know how many times I hear, oh, I don't like the snack my mom or dad packed for me. They can't argue with the person who packed the snack if they were the ones who did it. And I've seen I've seen people who have had like you pick one thing from this bin and one thing from this bin that you can have a control. You can have control over what they choose by offering different things, but let them pack their snack. Um, learning how to zip a Ziploc bag. If they're using Ziploc bags, that getting that zipper, putting on a coat, putting a coat, taking a coat, um, from if you know how the arms get inside out, knowing how to pull the arms back out, you would be amazed the number of kids mm -hmm. that have no idea that if you just reach your arm and grab it and pull it, that it'll come out. Zipping, buttoning, uh, belts, overall thing, overall hooks, any of those shoes, tying shoes, when you're putting your shoes on, pull the tongue out so it's not all scrunched up and then it you know, drives them crazy the rest of the day. Those are all really simple things. And even hand washing. I know everybody goes, oh, but my we do water, soap, and then I have my kids on a line and they have to go to the back of the line. Taking the time, because what they'll do is they'll get the soap, they'll turn on the water, they'll run their hands under the water, the soap washes off, they've never rubbed it. 
So even yeah. that simple, and you might be like, well, my kid knows how to wash her hands, come into my classroom and watch. And you'll see. <laughs> but now they know because that has been our routine. Water, and they'll say it, water, soap, back of the line. Because by the time they get up, they've been rubbing their hands together long enough. Yes. So that, I mean, that's, a, those are all simple things. Opening a lunchbox, opening a thermos bottle, opening a Capri yeah. Sun with that straw. I always teach them rip the straw in the middle because it comes out easier, but how to put a straw in. They're all things that people are like, oh, I never thought of that. But those are right. you, because you so, you so without thinking, just open it. You just do it and you're doing something else at the same time and you don't, you don't really pay attention. Teaching them how to use their fingers to pull a bag apart if they're trying to open it. Because the fine motor skills I have seen this year are really kids are struggling with the fine motor stuff. And that's using those pinchers to push, a, to pinch and pull. Or they have a hard time. That's why they end up using scissors. Interesting. What are good ways to work on fine motor skills? Because as you were mentioning, even um, buttoning their pants mm -hmm. or doing a zipper, I think of those as little fine motor skills. Mm -hmm. Are there games to work on that? Or do you think it's just practical application? It's teaching them to do these things that we need at school. You can do both. And, and fine motor is not just for school. I mean, it's, if you think about how often you use that pinch or grip, how often you use it in everyday life, but you can do, you can do games like put pennies down and have a contest to see who can flip the pennies the fastest because you have to use oh, yeah. those two fingers to do the pennies. Uh, building with clothespins and popsicle sticks, the pinch of the clothespins. Um, if you're doing some kind of repair and you have nuts and bolts, letting them screw the nut on the bolt, um, using tweezers to pick out. We have, I have the letter beads that you can get at Michael's or the dollar store. We call the dollar store the teacher's boutique, but you have the little beads and using tweezers to pick those out or pick little things out. Um, you can put, you can put play, just using Play-Doh using play-doh use putting hiding something in the play-doh and they have to pull it apart to try to find what's mm -hmm. in there there are so many easy ways scissors are a big thing um i have so many kids that hold their scissors upside down and they don't so instead of holding it with the thumb in the one little space mm -hmm. and the the fingers in the bigger space, they put their thumb in the big space and then try to cram fingers in the little hole. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to do it this way and it they get frustrated because it doesn't work. So let them use scissors. Scissors are okay. I know a lot of parents are like, oh, I don't want the mess or oh, they're gonna cut their hair or oh, they're gonna cut their clothes. Um, but then that kicks into natural consequences. Uh, and <laughs> having messed up hair, well, having messed up hair, or you're showing me that you can't use the scissors safely. So now to make your whatever you're making, you're, you're going to have to figure out how to do it without scissors. And it just mm -hmm. takes a kid once if they're not being safe with the scissors, you know, like taking them up near somebody's face. Yeah, that's probably not real safe. So you'll have to use something else. And we're making a craft of some kind where they're trying to cut a circle out to make a face and now they don't have the scissors how are they going to do it well they're going to have to rip and then it's not going to look like they want it to look and so it all kind mm -hmm. of falls and that's another fine motor is ripping paper just tearing paper i love to do do, do torn paper crafts like you could draw the shape of an apple and then have them rip red paper into small pieces that is real. If you don't think about that, you're like, oh, any kid can rip paper. I have ripped paper around my house all the time. But when kids, I have kids that just, they try to do it with their whole hand, that ripping little, and they have to be little pieces, little pieces of paper. They're, they're all sorts of little things they can do. Um, lacing cards. Remember those good old lacing cards yeah. we did as kids? Oh, yeah. Lacing cards are great. Showing them how to play jacks. Do you remember the old game came out in the 19, I think it's the 30s. Um, jacks that 
having to pick up that jack and catch the ball, you know, that, that having that pinch to pick up the, the, um, the jack clothespins using clothespins for things as well. They're all, all little things, tongs. If you're cooking or something and you have tongs that they could pick something up and move it over to something else, but that's, you know, the tongs are like big tweezers. Sounds like all the old school mm-hmm. things are the best yes, things. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's all super helpful. So what else would you like all the parents to know or think about when it comes to kindergarten? Um, I would love my main, main focus as a kindergarten teacher is their social, emotional, their interpersonal skills liking school, the academics, yeah, they get, that's great. I'm not worried if a kid comes in and doesn't know all of their letters. If, for me, if they don't know all their letters, but they can share with somebody else, they mm-hmm. can, they know how to use their words to resolve conflict. Mm-hmm. They, they know it's okay to have big emotions. Kids have big emotions. And that's okay to have big emotions, but it's how do I handle and get myself back so where the emotions aren't taking over. Um, we, you know, the, the zones of regulation. I'm not in green. I'm out of green. I'm in red right now. What can I do to help me get back into that green zone? What can I do to help me get back to that, to where I need to be? Um, I find a lot of kids look to adults to solve their problems let them figure it out. I I need to tape this on. I need to put these together, but I don't know what to do. Rather than handing them the tape and saying, here, use tape, say, huh, I wonder if I wanted to put two things together, what I could use to make it stick. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And the kid will be like, oh, tape or a stapler or whatever. But l- don't immediately jump in to solve the problem, uh, let the kids resolve the conflict. The way I have kids do it is I would say, um, Beth, Allison has something she needs to talk to you about. And Allison would say, mm-hmm. I didn't like it when you touched my face with your hand. And then Al- Beth, I would tell Beth, Beth, you need to help Allison feel safe. So you need to ask her, Allison, how can I make you feel safe? Allison, how can I make you feel safe? It's usually how they always say it. Um, And then you, Allison might say, you can draw me a picture. I had a kid yesterday who she said, and it was somebody had touched her cheek and she didn't like it. And the, the little boy said, how can I make you feel safe? And she said, you can give me a hug. And they, they Mm. did a big hug. They can say, some kids will say, say you're sorry. When they do that, I always add, what are you sorry for? So they. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that because I was actually, as you were just giving that example mm-hmm. before you even got to, I'm sorry, I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on making young children say sorry? Because it's kind of controversial mm-hmm. at this point on whether we should be making our children apologize with the theory being we're just making them say something, but they aren't actually sorry. I'd love to know your thoughts on that because I know during your time of being a teacher, this has evolved because I feel like the thought on this has evolved significantly in the last 10 Mm -hmm. years. Absolutely. I do not make kids say sorry. Um, To me, it's just like, okay, I'm sorry. Well, what are you, right. What are you sorry for? Do you even know what you did? You're they're quick to say, and it's funny because they'll come up and say, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry," and I'll say, "Well, what are you sorry for?" Uh, I don't know. Um, they need yeah. to understand what they they need to understand what they did had consequences. It had it had an effect on somebody else. So that's why I say. Allison, what's going to make you feel safe? Or Allison, what's going to make you feel better? You feel, you you made Mm -hmm. you feel kind of sad. What's going to make you feel better? And some kids may, that way I know a sorry for you may not do it. 
But mm -hmm. that's why I treat, but when they say they're sorry, I always say, what are you sorry for? And mm -hmm. the kid, that way they're acknowledging this is what I did. And then if the other kid says, well, that's okay, because a lot of kids say, well, that's okay. I will say, no, it's not okay. It's not okay that they did that. You can say, I accept mm -hmm. your apology, but it is not okay mm -hmm. that they did something to make you not feel safe. Right. Because that I think we're so quick to, okay, and then the kid thinks, oh, well, I can smack her in the face again, and she's, I'll say sorry, and she'll say, okay, it's okay, and I can do right. it. Right. Yeah. And what if the child, when you say, I love that, and actually I'm totally going to try this with my mm -hmm. nine and 10 year old. Uh, what about if the child, when I, if I were to say, what are you sorry for? Because I have a, a child who's quick to say, I'm sorry. I already said yeah. I'm sorry. Like when the other one comes, I already told her I'm sorry. And if I were to say, which I have not tried, but what are you sorry for? And if she were to say, I don't know, or yeah, let's okay. just take that. If she says, I don't know, well, how would you respond to that? Or is she apologizing to the other child? Is that like, give me. Yeah, like sometimes I, the example I'm yep. thinking of, she'll say, I said, I'm sorry, but it was an accident. Ooh, I love so that. She, like, it's kind of, I know she's not mm -hmm. really sorry. And frankly, half the time I know it wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. That's like a really good cop mm -hmm. out is to say it's an accident. I threw that ball and it hit her in the face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, really? Was it an accident? Yeah. Or did you know you could throw it and hit her in the face because she was annoying you and you could say it was mm -hmm. an accident? So let's just take that example because that's a real one that happens in my okay. household. And I don't want to say where well, my struggle is. I don't want to say you're lying. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't an accident. Also, you're not sorry. I get real stuck there. So let's take that one because I feel like whether it's a kindergartner or a nine-year-old, we deal with those sort of things. So the first thing I always do is say, tell me what was happening. What game were you playing? What, what was going on? So I can kind of have them describe what happened. Because it, you will truly know, well, we were playing ball or I was playing ball and she was over by the playground and I threw the ball and she didn't see it coming and it whacked her in the head. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was prob that could have been an accident. Mm -hmm. Well, we were playing. She was saying something I didn't like and then I threw the ball. Hmm, now that might be a little bit different. And so kind of, again, just like we did with the I can't, getting to the bottom of okay getting to the root of so what what was the situation and i like to hear it from both sides too you know there's two sides to every story and a lot of times it will be well you know she threw the ball and hit me in the head and then the other one will say well but you beforehand were tripping me walking across the playground and so that is then we have a whole different thing because now it's well, I probably did throw the ball on purpose, but this happened. Now, when it's an accident, I'll say, well, how were you throwing? Show me what you were doing. Um, I had a kid who accidentally um, pushed another kid, although he claimed it wasn't a push. And the other kid's like, no, oh, he pushed me. And I said to him, show me exactly what you're doing. He's like, well, I put my hands out and went like this. And I said, well, that is a push. No, it isn't. I was like, well, that's what, when you go like that and you touch somebody and you move, make them move, that's called a push. Oh, so, hmm, how do you think you made that person feel when you pushed them? And then they realize, ooh, okay, maybe it wasn't an, you know, oh, okay. And it may have been, you know, if they said I was running and I bumped into them, Again, getting to that root of what yeah. was happening at the time. And if they yeah. persist in saying it was an accident, and usually it gets that, no, it wasn't, yes, it was, no, it wasn't, yes, it was, kind of argument, I go back to, all right, well, I, don't, I wasn't there, so I don't know if it was an accident or not, but we'll go back to Beth and Allison. Beth, Allison doesn't feel safe because of the ball that hit her in the face. What can you do to make her feel safe? 
going back to that what yeah. what is it that's going to make her feel safe whether it was an accident or not she still doesn't feel safe she doesn't feel mm -hmm. comfortable around you right now because of this mm -hmm. action so if you threw the ball and it was an accident you need to understand that that accident caused somebody to be hurt whether they were really hurt mm -hmm. or not but it caused somebody not to feel good so going right. back to that so going back to that just digging being a detective digging into that what happened but not in an acute like what did you do but more as a tell me what would tell me what you were playing when it happened tell me what was going on when it happened to try to get mm -hmm. and make it more conversational which is hard because if it's like the 400th time that day they've come yes. to you and you're in the midst of trying to do something and they're arguing and you're about to yank your hair out um it's hard and it may be you need to say you know what right now i cannot talk to you because i am really frustrated right now and right. i can't talk to you right now it's not that i can't talk to you i am because you know we don't use the word can't i it, it would be hard for me to talk to you right now because i'm feeling really frustrated I need to take a few minutes to myself so I can calm myself down and get myself together before I come talk to you. So you go over there and look at a book. You go, you go over there and I'll come to you when I feel like I'm ready and can do it calmly. It's okay right. to let your kid know that sometime, you know, that adults get upset too. Adults get frustrated. Adults get angry. And rec giving them that strategy, modeling that strategy of right now, I, I, am, I am not in a good place to talk to you. I need to take a moment for myself. I need to, or I just will start counting to 10 right in front of them. I'll just close my eyes and be like, and just modeling what I would like them to do. Because the next time somebody does it to them, they're going to be like, oh, hey, my mom, do you remember that time she told me she needed to go get herself together? That must be okay. Because if an adult does it, it must be okay. Yeah. And I think that also comes to our kids seeing us not be perfect. Yes. And also being willing to repair mm -hmm. that. So I have those moments where particularly over the summer, I think about when my kids were home all the time. And there is that time where I feel like this is the fifth time today they've come to me. And there's one on this particular day that is clearly the one mm -hmm. not having great emotional yep. regulation and kind of the instigator. And I can think of one very clear incident this summer where it was like the fifth time I was working on a project outside and they came to me and I kind of went off the handle mm -hmm. on the instigator. And then she ran inside crying, you know, you always think I did something. And usually she doesn't respond that mm -hmm. way when she does do something. And then my other daughter came up and said, well, actually, you know, this happened yeah. and this happened. And I actually do, don't think she meant that. And I said, I appreciate you telling me that. And I need you to go inside and ask her to come back out. And then I had to apologize. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I did not get all the information and I'm really sorry. And I flew off the handle and I shouldn't have done that. And even grown ups sometimes their patience mm -hmm. is not where it should be. And so for me, that's been a learned practice mm -hmm. of repair. I don't think that's necessarily something that happened in my house. Yeah. <laughs> if people went off as a, when I was a kid, if people went off the handle, there wasn't really apologized to small no. children. Um, and so for me, that's something I've been working on a lot in recent years is when I have those moments where I lose my patience, which sadly I feel like happens more than I wish mm -hmm. it did, to take that moment to myself and then go apologize or own, yes. at least own my behavior. Yes. And I like to think it's going to pay off. But we have those days, particularly when I have them home all summer, where it's mm -hmm. like they are just at each other. And eventually I blow a gasket. Yep. Well, and, and what you said before, what you kind of started off that story with is that it's okay for kids to know that we make mistakes. Um, that mm -hmm. is one of the, the, a big thing that I think kids need to know that adults make mistakes, that adults fly off the handle, that we do those things. And 
everybody does them. And whether it's I, I dropped a glass and it broke. That was, you know, that was a mistake. How you react to that is going to say a lot like, oh, ugh, can't believe I did that. Let me clean it up um, kind of mm. thing. Because then if a kid drops it and you say, oh, you know what? That happens to everybody. What do you think we should do? I think we need to clean it up. All right, let's figure it out. But admitting to you need to make, you need to express your emotions and say, I'm having a moment. I get frustrated. I get upset. I cry. It's okay to cry. Mm -hmm. um, but making, admitting to mistakes. Oh, I'm cutting something out and it's not the perfect circle. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I started drawing something and I put something I didn't want in it. Oh, I don't need to crumple that up and throw it away. I'll just, let me see how I can make it into something different or let me flip the paper over and use the other side. Mm -hmm. The world is not going to end if you make a mistake. Um, that mm -hmm. I, I think it's so important for kids to see that adults have the same feelings and the same, do the, some of the same things kids do. Because they totally. to, they think, well, they never, grownups know everything. They never make mistakes. I am the first to admit I make mistakes all the time. In fact, one year my class kept tally marks on how many mistakes I made in a day because it was, I was like, ah, oh, there I go again. I made another mistake. Well, that's number six for today yeah. and it's only eight o'clock. Um, but how I reacted to making the mistake was yeah. it's big. And I think. The not knowing everything is yes. important too. I, I coach parents through this a lot when it comes to sleep, particularly as kids get towards you know, preschool, mm -hmm. early elementary, that they'll say, well, when you want me to present this to my child and we're changing a lot of things, I'll say, yeah, you can start by saying, I talked to a sleep expert or I learned some more about sleep. Did you know that mom does not know everything about sleep? Isn't that so mm -hmm. funny that moms don't know everything? We don't, but I learned something new today. And now that I know better, we're gonna change some things because that's what I do all the time. I learn things, I change things. And I really have tried even with my own health journey to empower my mm -hmm. children to realize you're gonna learn throughout your whole life. Yes. I will always tell them I was listening to this book on this, my walk today, and I learned something new. And based on what I learned, I'm going to start lifting heavier weights or mm -hmm. I'll, and I'll tell them why. And so I think trying to encourage them to be lifelong learners yes. and to not assume their parents know everything. I've had plenty of things with a, my daughter, who's kind of in early puberty, yeah. asking me questions where either I'm not sure of the age appropriate answer or I don't actually remember mm -hmm. specifically the answer and I want to be accurate yep. and I will say that's a great question I don't totally know the right answer so I'm going to do a little research and report back yes. to you yeah and that's okay to tell them you don't know I don't know right where do you think we could figure that find that let's let's find that answer together let's what we can right. do together to figure out that answer um, that it's okay. I have kindergartners coming in thinking they're supposed to know how to do everything. And if they mm. don't know how to do something, they get incredibly upset. Like, I, I don't know how to do that. And I just, it's okay. That's, that gives me some, I, I've got to teach you something this year. So that gives me a little something I need to teach you. You're not expected to know any of this. And nine times out of 10, when I'm asking them things, I will start it out with, I don't expect anybody to know this because right. that kind of sets the, okay, if you know it, then I'm going to be like, what, how in the, oh my goodness, what am I going to teach you this year then? But letting them right. know it's, I don't expect you to know everything. I don't know everything. We talk about that, but it's that perfect, going back to that perfectionism, that making mistakes, that vulnerability, that crying, it's okay to cry in front of your kids. Mm -hmm. Let them see it. Let them know I had to, I had to go to a class. I had to go talk to somebody to find the answer to this because I didn't know what to do. I think is so, right. it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And I think some kids, 
I'm sure I've, my kids are perfectionists in a different way. Mm -hmm. They're very, my children are polar opposite. And when my one daughter was four, someone coached me through this about seeing her perfectionism that didn't come off as your Mm -hmm. typical perfectionism. So that was a little more complicated. But then because they had brought it to my attention and talked about how this is not actually a good thing. So you want to be acutely aware Mm -hmm. of this and encourage mistake making. I was a little more on it with my second daughter. Hers came out in a different way. And actually, her first grade teacher said something that really made me laugh. And I appreciated she had this, um, she would get a, a on her daily planner in first grade, a dot based on what the behavior was for that day. Mm-hmm. So parents had an idea of how they were behaving. So it was either green, yellow, or orange or something. And this is my introvert. Mm-hmm. So she got a green every day and you had to initial by it. And I had not initialed for a few days because she always got green. And one day she kind of was like slinking out the door and it I caught on to her odd mm-hmm. demeanor. And I was like, wait, what's happening? And why do you have that planner in your hand? And she had put my initials oh. next to this orange dot. And I was like, wow, this, there's a lot of things happening yep. right here. Um, first of all, Getting an orange Mm -hmm. is not the end of the world. That's okay. But now we have this whole other situation where you've like forged my initials. And so I had to reach out to the teacher. And in a way, he laughed and he said, look, Ainsley could use some more orange dots in Mm -hmm. her life, like a yellow dot or whatever the dot was. He was like, she could use some more. And we got to work on that. And I said, of course, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. And so... We, th- that was a big learning moment for a lot of reasons. And it made me think about how would I have reacted? I I think I would have taken it fine yeah. to have her have an orange dot, but that we had to kind of work through that. And so, but I caught on to it right mm-hmm. away, even though it's different than my other daughter of like, wow, that's a form of perfectionism. Yes. She was terrified to show me mm-hmm. like she was less than perfect. Mm-hmm. After whatever, a streak of 60 perfect days yep. or something ridiculous. And th- and that is that some kids that that's their perfectionism of I, I am, I never make, I, like at school, I'm always doing exactly what the teacher said. I'm never doing, I'm always right there. And if they do, and you have to say, you know, inside voice or whatever, and they're like devastated because, <gasps> yes. And then some of them that the anxiety comes up because of that right yeah and that's helping them and that's another thing we're seeing a lot of is anxiety a lot of kids just being anxious about making a mistake about going home and having to tell mom or dad or grandparent or whoever the caretaker is that i got you know mrs franco had to say something to me today or whatever it was but that there are all sorts of ways that kids will show it and it's being aware of being in tune like you said i knew something wasn't right it's being in tune with that and openly communicating with your child's teacher is another um, and i'm just going to kind of veer off here but is another big thing if if something's going on at home or i tell my parents if if it was just an off morning, just pop me an email, send, let me know, because that's going to affect their day at school. I'm Mm going to, they're going to come in and they're going to be off and I'm probably going to let it say to you anyway, Hey, is anything, what's up? They just seemed out of sorts today. But if you let me know, we had a rough morning at home. In fact, I got, I, I got a text from a parent this morning saying, Hey, I just wanted you to know he was really emotional coming into school today. He, his brother and his brother's friend are really close. They carpool together. The brother's friend hasn't been going to school. And today he was back. And so the little brother who I have was kind of teary because he was very protective of the older brother and wanting just to be with the older brother. And you know, just want to give you that heads up. And I thank them, forwarded on to the, you know, the people that needed to know. But that for me... Even that little piece of information can make all the difference. It might be your kid needs an extra hug that day. They might need just a little extra reassurance. Mm -hmm. They might just need a little extra time to themselves. But communicating that because the 
when a kid goes to school, I, I see your child more than you do probably in a day. If you think about in the amount of time they are at school, the total amount of time is probably more than you have when they're awake. Particularly if they're getting enough sleep. Exactly. Get them to, exactly <laughs> as they should be. If you're getting more time than I am, then something is not right. Um, but that it that communication is is key. It's really big. Totally. Can we talk about? We've talked about some of this kind of negative behavior, yeah. but can we talk about encouraging kindness and empathy? in children. And I know, I guess I'm assuming that that's a big yes. part of what's happening in these early grades. And I'd love to know your thoughts on how parents can do that at home. So I, in my classroom have, and there's a book called, Have You Filled Your Bucket Today? Which, or Have You Filled Love a Bucket book. Today? One of my favorites. And we read that. And then I have what I call bucket slips. So I have a little piece of paper and it says two and you write, the kid writes the other kid's name. You filled my bucket today, your friend, and they write it. And then on the back, we write what that child did to fill that person's bucket. So we'll go back to Beth and Allison. Allison comes up and says, Beth filled my bucket today. I dropped my lunch and she helped me clean it up. And so mm -hmm. I would have Allison write to Beth from Allison. And on the back, I would say, you help me clean it up. And at the end of the day, my kids will, will share bucket slips. And so we make that, we tell everybody what they did and we hand it the bucket slip to take home. Um, and I start that, I try to get us settled into the school year first and then we'll, we'll kick off into bucket slips. But it, to me, it is so important for kids to understand, the have empathy and kindness for others. It is so at home, it might be somebody drops, some, somebody drops their sweater. Let's go over and pick that up and hand it to them. Or mm -hmm. um, the neighbor, it, you know, the neighbor needs help with something. Let's go over and help mm -hmm. the neighbor. Um, but it might be just writing a note to somebody. You made me feel really good today. Just mm. little simple things you can do and to, yeah. and to recognize when your child, wow, that was, that was really being a good friend or that was being a really good sister. How did that make you feel? Didn't that yeah. make, how did you feel inside when you did this? Well, I felt really good. How do you think that other person felt? Well, they probably felt really good too. Yes. And being, again, yeah. going back to that parent as a role model, setting the example for here is how, here are ways that you can show kindness. It isn't necessarily having to get somebody something. It might be you see mm -hmm. somebody playing by themselves on the playground and going up to them and saying, mm -hmm. would you like to play with me? It might yeah. be simple as someone looks like they're not having a good day and just saying, I really like your shirt. Because yeah. that one little positive might be what that person needed to turn their day around. Right. Yeah. And I also love that book. Have you filled a bucket today? I can't remember how it ended up on my radar. I, somewhere it was recommended mm -hmm. to me and I bought it for my kids. And they really, without much encouragement, gravitated to it. And they really picked up the language. I almost feel like, however, so obviously an educator probably wrote it because <laughs> It was very mm -hmm. easy for the children to wrap their arms around it. And for a long time, when they were in this kind of preschool, probably kindergarten age, I might get one of my kids would come to me and say, she's emptied my mm -hmm. bucket. Yep. And so it gave them language, back to using the words, of expressing how they felt. And so I found initially I heard a lot about how when their buckets were getting emptied. But then at some point I heard um, – Adam, that's why I love your slips you're mm -hmm. doing because Adam Grant, I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with him, but he had said one of the ways to encourage kindness with our kids is to ask them at the end of the day if they experience kindness in any way. And this is kind of like your slips. And he said the benefit of them knowing every single day at dinner you're going to ask if they experience kindness is they will be looking mm -hmm. for it. And 
so much of our world, and I truly believe this, is what are we looking for? If we're looking for everybody on the road to annoy us, everybody on the road is going to annoy mm-hmm. us. And so all of those things. And so after I heard him mention this on a podcast, I thought, oh, this is like the evolution of filling the bucket. And so for years, I asked my kids, did you experience kindness today? And did you experience or witness unkindness mm-hmm. today? And it was a really powerful tool. It took a couple weeks for them to be looking for mm-hmm. it daily, but it would get to the point where they didn't even wait to dinner. Sometimes they'd hop in the car and they'd say, Mom, I experienced something kind or something unkind, or I did something mm-hmm. kind. And your example of the lunchbox was like, some th- there was some big debacle of a bunch of stuff spilled in the classroom. And my one daughter said, no one got up to help him. And so I went and mm-hmm. helped him. And I said, that's so great. How do you think it made him feel? And I think she said, I bet it filled his yeah. bucket. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was this really great example. And so I love that you do the slips mm-hmm. because – I felt like until I told them to look for kindness, I heard a lot about the emptying, Mm -hmm. but I had to kind of shift the mindset to say, yes, I'm happy to hear about the emptying. It gives us a lot of chance to talk about things like why we wouldn't treat someone that way Mm -hmm. and learn from it. But I loved making them look for the good. And it, I think it made them do more good because then they kind of saw this moment of, well, I'm, I'm going to do that. And then that's going to be the moment of kindness I tell mom about when I get in the car. Mm-hmm. It's going to be my kind. So what I will add to that is I do a roses, thorns, and buds at the end of the day with my kids. Mm. The rose is a good part of your day. The thorn is an icky part of your day. And the bud is something you learned. And you could apply that to the kindness as well. What was the rose? What was the kindness Absolutely. you saw? What was the thorn? What did you see today that that you don't think, you know, that either you saw or you experienced. And then did you learn, was there a bud? Is there anything you learned today about it? Um, So it can kind of go, we do it for our school day, but you could do it that way as well to kind of encourage that. I love that discussion of how did you see it? Because we don't talk enough about it. It's one of those, um, I think a lot of people call like a hidden curriculum, like kids are just supposed to know to be kind. They're just supposed to know Mm -hmm. to accept other people and they don't, they need, they need examples. And I have with having been in the public school, we have a lot of kids with different needs and we spend a lot of Mm times in the first six weeks about everybody needs something different. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's for you to make sure, you know, think about you and what you need to learn. It might not be the same as that person. And so how can you help that person? What can you do to help mm-hmm. that person? If you know that that person likes something to fidget with, what can you do to help them? Or if you know that person is going to be distracted, if you even touch, you know, if you're spinning around in a circle, what can you do to help that person as well? That everybody has different mm-hmm. needs and everybody has different ways of showing kindness. And right. it's, oh, different people do things different ways. And it's accepting, it's accepting that. that I have such a hard time if um, kids are because someone wears glasses or I have mm-hmm. one little, one girl one year who had hearing aids and she called them her ears. She had her ears. And that same year, I had a little girl with braces on her legs. And this is the one with the hearing aid said to the other, well, we're kind of the same. I have my ears and you have your boots. We both have something. (laughs) And I was like making that connect, but making that, making them both feel like, okay, we're both the same in the same way. It's okay. And and that everybody was, oh, wow, well, I have a mole and I have, you know, going off into that. It's so important for kids that they're going to carry that on the rest of their life. Um, Yeah. And I just thought of another quick little kind of holding the door for somebody. If you're going in or out of a store, holding the door for somebody, let me hold it. Taking a grocery store cart back to the grocery return for somebody like here, could I take that for you? Those are the little tiny things that you can do when you're, when you're out with your family, 
it's just there's right. such it, it's so so important because that and they really pick up on it yeah. my one daughter always says she had to write about me for some Uh-oh. class project and she said my mom loves to talk to strangers and <laughs> she she'll point it out all the time because it gave me the biggest chuckle mm-hmm. and she said mom you do it anywhere if you think someone needs help you talk to them. If they look lonely, you're going to talk to them. If you just think they sound interesting, you're hearing some story they're saying, you're going to mm-hmm. talk to them. And so the other day she came out of swim at ACAC. I was talking to a stranger. Mm-hmm. We wrapped up and she said, there you go again, <laughs> talking to those strangers. <laughs> but I think it's funny because all those little things you're doing yes. out in public, over the years, she's nine now, mm-hmm. and maybe I think when she was eight was when she wrote this piece of Mother's Day mm-hmm. thing about mom talks to strangers. But it's funny, I realized, wow, they really are just taking it all in, for yes. better or for worse. Yes. They're taking it in. And they're taking it at home. They're taking it at school. They're taking it, taking it in in the sports they play. They're anywhere yes. they go, they're taking it in. Yeah. And back to that point of empathy, as you were talking, it was making me think of when my girls were preschool, they had such a gift that during the summer, there was this little boy, Bennett, who's since Uh passed away, but he was in a wheelchair. And yes, and he would come to their preschool slash daycare Mm -hmm. during the summer. And he kind of overlapped more so with my older daughter. But I remember they did a lot of work on the outdoor play Mm -hmm. space to make it able to accommodate him in his wheelchair and he was a real personality Mm -hmm. he was a real treat and my daughter talked about him a lot and and it was devastating when he passed Mm -hmm. away and a little very hard for her to comprehend at that age but what I loved is she would say she saw him for his little spicy personality and then she would say and he could chase me around in his chair Mm -hmm. and we were playing tag and i helped him so she would then say and sometimes he needs help you know wanted a toy Mm -hmm. she might grab the toy for him and so i first of all it made me realize that young children can adapt very yes. well if given the chance they aren't as judgy mm-hmm. as adults are. absolutely so i had adm- i admired that and i think her preschool must have done the most fabulous job working with the children mm-hmm. and this young boy and i just always thought like what a gift this was for her to experience this uh and so i i think thinking about children's exposure to different people is important because at that age you can kind of teach them Mm -hmm. how they should respond Mm -hmm. absolutely and even if it's i had a a a kid one year that um fell ice skating and broke his leg and was in a wheelchair because it was he had the cast Mm -hmm. all the way up and the the kids instantly jumping in i didn't have to say anything and saying well he's going to need help we're going to have, okay, we need to have somebody that's going to push, be his wheelchair pusher. We need someone that, that'll that play, because he's not going to be able to play at recess. We need somebody that's going to play with him, like do games at the table or draw with him or do whatever. They're meeting. All right, Mrs. Franco, we need to solve this. We need to get this going. Yeah. And I love that, that they were wanting to be so proactive. And, and he, we literally called it his personal assistant. For the day, you know, the yeah. person who was the office helper that day was this boy's personal assistant. And he was the, she, that person was the one that wheeled him around, that helped him get things if he needed it, that did anything he, they were at, they were like right there. And one, one kid, he's like, just leave me alone because she just kept asking all day long, do you need anything? How can I help you? What can I do? Do you need anything? He's like, Mrs. Yeah. Franco. I just want her to leave me alone for a minute. <laughs> like, it's yeah. okay. But they uh, they are adaptable, whether it's a long-term something something ha- somebody has, or if it just happens and it's a short term, they're going to jump in and do what they can. And because, again, they have they don't have the, the, full, the ideas already formed. In their eyes, right. You know, you're no different than I am, except you wear glasses. But hey, I have sunglasses. So, you know, we're the same. 
kind of thing. They they yes. don't see that and they accept they are very accepting of people of who they are and how they are. Right. And, but it does take the modeling. It does, it does take. Yeah. And then when they bring that home, encouraging them to continue to do with others that they see. Yes. And I also, it's, this is making me think of um, my one daughter who's not the introvert, mm-hmm. who just says whatever's on her mind. When she was little, there was a period where if she saw someone who was black, she might say, mom, look how dark her skin is. And it's funny that my natural reaction was to be yeah. like, Shh, like, that's embarrassing that mm-hmm. she's like calling out this woman's skin color. And at some point in my just education of learning to navigate this, they said, by doing that, you you make them think that something's a little yeah. off. And it was a little bit like the whole wheelchair mm-hmm. thing when it's like, look at that boy in a wheelchair. And it's like, instead... I had to change how I'd react to say, yes, she has dark skin. It's beautiful, right? Or, yes, he's in a wheelchair. That's pretty cool. I wonder if he'd show you how he Mm -hmm. uses it. And it's funny how, I don't know, I guess you get a little jaded over time as you get older, that instead of kind of embracing their observation, which is totally from a place of interest, we unintentionally teach them, like, you shouldn't talk about things that are Mm -hmm. different. And that I thought was a great, I wish I could remember where I was equipped with that um, knowledge, but shifting to that, I found to be very empowering. So she pointed out someone's hair look different, like look at her braids or Mm -hmm. her hair is so long, anything. I might just say it is, Mm -hmm. isn't that cool? Or I had a daughter who loved to point out tattoos. Uh. One of my children loved to point out tattoos. And it was like, oh yeah, that's like art on her Mm -hmm. arm. Whereas the old me would have been like, Shh, we don't talk about people. We exactly. See them. And so it's funny how those little things, that age group really can glom on. Well, and you know, you, if you think about a lot, what we've talked about so far has been the, the changing of the mind shift of the adult. Yes. It's changing yes. the way you think about things and I know no pressure, no pressure. to all the parents. No, don't it's, worry. It's just us <laughs> messing our kids up every day. Exactly. But it's okay. You're allowed to make mistakes. Um, but <laughs> right. but it, it really is the shifting because in some ways, I would love people to think like a kid. You know, right. sit and think like a kid. They're not, they're not pointing out this person is different because, oh, wow, this is, they're, they're curious like, I wonder how they do this, or I wonder how they do that, or I wonder why they wanted that on their arm, that tattoo on their arm, or, you know, they're, they're just, they're curious about everything. And it's that right. adults having to, to shift times have changed. I mean, think yeah. back when you were a kid, those were, those were things you would have gotten the shush and it's having to change that, that thinking it's hard. It's hard, but right. it's doable. It takes practice. Well, this has all been so great. And before we wrap up, I have no doubt that there's some parent thinking, are they going to get to the reading? Because I really need to know what my child should know about reading in kindergarten. So I'd love to just hear your thoughts on reading as it relates to kindergarten and your thoughts on what, if anything, you want parents to do at home as it relates to the topic of reading. Um, Read with your kid. Read every day, read 15 minutes, let them see you reading. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really want kids to love reading. And if it feels like a chore, they're not going to like it. So the, the best thing you can do is when you're read with your child and ask them questions about what you're reading. What do you think is going to happen next? Oh, wow. Even uh, how, if you were to end this story, would you end it the same way or would you make up something different? Um, letter sounds, yes, they need to know those. But guess what I teach in kindergarten? I teach the letter sounds. If your child has an interest, then by all means, go with it. But it should mm-hmm. not be something forced because you're just forcing them to do something they don't want to do. And then that's going to cause a, I don't like to do this. 
kind of thing. So if they have an interest in letters, you can walk around the house, let do a do a hunt around the house or while you're writing the grocery list, I need Cheerios. Will you go find the Cheerios in the closet for me? They're reading because they have to know what the Cheerios looks like that we call that environmental print. Things they see in the world that they know from in their environment. So Cheerios, the McDonald's, Bodos, um all of, well, for those people who aren't around Charlottesville, they wouldn't know photos, but it's a really good bagel place. <laughs> but they're, those are things that they're reading. And I, I would say, my gosh, oh my gosh, you're reading. And the kid will be like, no, I'm not. What's that? It says this. Oh, well, maybe I am. But ta- only take, let, take the lead from your child. Read mm-hmm. every night. Yes, without question. And find books they're interested in. Read fiction, read nonfiction. They could write a story. You could tell a story together. Any of that kind of thing. But take it, take the cue from your child of if they're interested. Mm-hmm. And there's, I am not a big fan of worksheets um, or workbooks. Mm-hmm. When I was in college, I was pretty much told I wouldn't graduate if I ever follow the lesson up with a worksheet. Um, so I have this I get like a tick whenever somebody's like, let's do a worksheet. And I'm like, Whoa. Um, but there's so many ways you can write letter. If you want to, if they're interested in letters on an index card, have your child help you write the letter of the uppercase and lowercase or two uppercase on two index cards and play memory or play go fish. Mm-hmm. Those are little things that they can help do as well. Um, and I'm going to throw right. in really quick when they're writing those letters, make sure they're holding their pencil. I don't, not the dag. I like to call this the dagger grip because it looks yes. like they have a dagger, but holding their pencil with a proper pencil grip, their pencil grip. And all I have right here is a hammer, but um, is you can hold it like this. You can hold two fingers up uh-huh. or the OT say, this is okay as well. But this okay. is the hammer grip. This is the dagger grip. Yep. Or some kids just have this very loose wispy. That's not, you yep. want them to hold it like that. And one trick I have is to give them something to hold in their hand while they're holding mm-hmm. whatever it is. Let me see if I can grab a bottle right here. Um, that they have to, don't let that fall out. You've got to hold oh, that like in. a little ball. Yeah. So for those just listening, she's got almost like a little ball in her hand that the other three fingers are holding. And then her two fingers that we want to be yep. the most effective the, are holding the thumb and the pointer the are holding at the top yep. and it's resting on the middle finger. And then the other ones are holding in. It could be a cotton ball. It could be a pom pom. You could wad up a tissue any little thing and tell them yeah. don't let it drop floor is lava is a big game for kids right now so don't let it drop in the lava let how hold on to that don't let it fall super helpful so there's something else the parents can yes. focus on if they need to channel their energy it's to help them hold their pencil crayon whatever, whatever it may be yes in a more proper way and to not say they'll pick that up yes. later yeah because once they get their grip in it you can it's so hard for us to quote unquote break a pencil grip like get them to hold it the right way because they've been doing it for mm. how many years now doing it this way and now this meanie's trying to try to make me so really doing with that but even having them do letters writing letter that's doing that pencil grip it's also doing the, um, right. the the reading, helping identify those things. But reading with your Absolutely. kid every day is the biggest thing you can do. And if, if they're not sure what a word is, or if you think it's a word they might not know, ask them, what do you think that means? The vocabulary, mm-hmm. you know, what do you think swampy means? That's kind of a weird right. word. What do you think that means? And start and building that vocabulary. Great. Well, all of this has been so helpful. I think kindergarten is such a big year for a lot of kids, but also for a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. And I love this practical advice that you've shared. And I think it helps us keep in perspective of of what we need to be focused on. And we've covered a lot 
If there is one thing that you would like parents to take away from this episode, what would that be? Oh, can it be a really long thing? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, the big thing is let your child be independent and see that it's okay to be a human, so to speak. So that means it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to cry. It's okay. It's okay to do all of those things that you're going to be a lifelong learner, but let, let them be kids. Give them the joy of childhood. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Thank you so thank much you. for joining me today, Meg. And I just want to thank you for pursuing this career in teaching. I know this is not for everyone. I could never do it. So I have such great admiration for you and the other teachers out there. And I certainly hope our paths cross again I soon. I do too. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Bye, bye. for now. Thank you for listening to How Long Till Bedtime. To learn how we can work together to improve your child's sleep, please visit sleepandwellnesscoach.com.